I would like to welcome you to this series of lessons on data analysis and visualization using the R programming language. Now, this series of lessons is given as part of a course that is given at Linköping University in Sweden. It is given for bachelor students in biology and animal psychology. Course code is NBIB53. But my hope is that whoever you might be and whatever your background is, you might find these lessons useful if your goal is to learn the principles of efficient data analysis using R. So let me give you a brief overview of what R is. So R is a programming language that was actually developed by statisticians for statisticians. So while it is a versatile and general purpose tool, it is, its primary strength is in statistical computing and statistical graphics. Now, it was originally designed in the early 1990s by the two people you see on the slide, Ross Ihaka and Robert Gentleman. And to understand where they came from and what they modeled their design on, we have to go back in time a little bit to the mid-1970s. So in the mid-1970s, a language called S was developed at Bell Laboratories, S for statistics, because that language was really designed to aid statistical computing. Now, later, in the 80s, there was a commercial implementation of that original S language that was called S+. Now, when Ihaka and Gentleman designed their language R, what they wanted to do is that that language should, uh, their goal was for that language to be able to run S plus programs unchanged, at least in most of the cases. So one could just take the programs one had written in S plus, plug it into R, and it would run it. So this also explains why the language is actually called R. There are two reasons. One of that is that both first names of the two designers start with an R. The other one is a bit of an insider joke in that R is the letter that comes before S in the alphabet. So it's a, a different way of saying that the language is S minus, a slightly downgraded version of the language S plus. Now, R is a free and open source tool. And what this means is that anyone could go online and simply check how R is actually implemented, how it does its magic under the hood. This is exactly the kind of information that is often a trade secret and we're not allowed to look at in proprietary software. But R is a free and open source software, so we can look. And this is a very important key virtue that we're looking for, because one of the most important things in science is transparency. That is, we don't like to have things up our sleeves. We want to know exactly how something that we implement actually works. And R, because it, it is open source, it actually fulfills that principle. Not to mention that it is free, so one doesn't have to pay in order to be able to use it. So over the years, R has become a very popular and widely used tool in all areas, but in the sciences especially, and it is fair to say that it is hands down the single most popular tool amongst biologists, at least as of early 2024, as I am recording this. Why is that popularity? Well, one of the reasons is certainly the fact that there is extensive package support out there. And an R package is simply an R program or set of programs that were created by some user and made available for the rest of the community. So what this means is that the rest of the community does not need to solve problems from scratch. They do not need to reinvent the wheel. They can just rely on the packages to perform those tasks. For example, if you work in genetics, you might have solved some problem written a program to solve a problem in, gen in genetic analysis and then you make that available to the rest of the community and then they do not need to write it from scratch they can just use your program to solve these problems and that will greatly speed up your workflow so R has many many packages aiding uh, biological analysis so let's see some examples first of all more generally in terms of data manipulation and data visualization there are several packages that actually form a nice ecosystem of packages that usually goes under the name of the tidyverse. So the tidyverse is not actually a single package, but a suite of packages. And in this particular course, we are going to be looking at extensively and seeing what you can do with it.
And then if you happen to be interested in genetics, there are several packages to aid you like Bioconductor and others. If you're a community ecologist like yours truly, or if you're interested in community ecology, then there are packages like Vegan and others. And the list goes on and on. It doesn't really matter what area of biology you work in. You're sure to find several packages that will greatly aid you in your daily work. Up to this point, we've been discussing what R is. And R by itself is perfectly bare bones, in fact. All it does is it takes in instructions formatted in a way that R can understand and executes them. And that is fine, but it doesn't really help us with uh, our workflow, with managing our packages, or any of those things that we would like to do. So that is why there's another program called R Studio, which helps with all of that. Now, R Studio has been developed by many people, but I will mention one name that you can see on the screen, Hadley Wickham, uh, who is one of the main people behind the development of our studio and behind the development of the Tidyverse, in fact. I don't want to claim that it's uh, uh, just due to Hadley. There are many, many people there working uh, on this, just like R wasn't only developed by Rossi Haka and Robert Gentleman. There are many people responsible for its development. But I did want to mention him because um, he's the person who spearheaded uh, our studio and the tidyverse. So again, R is just a program which takes in commands written in R and executes them. And R Studio is an environment that makes it pleasant to work with R programs. So within R Studio, we can access R and communicate with it directly, but it also allows us to do much, much more. And I'm going to give a short demonstration soon after this. So if you do not already have R and R Studio installed on your computer, you can install them using the links that you can see on the slide. First, you should install R, then following that, you should install R Studio. And when you install, you will have the option of choosing your operating system, whether you're under Windows or you're using a Mac or you're using uh, Linux, you will have the option to install these programs. Uh, one thing that you should keep in mind is try to install the latest version uh, as of now, which is 2024 January. The latest version of R is 4.3.2. So you will be doing best and the best service to yourself if you are installing that latest R version. So for the rest of the time, let me just show you how R Studio works from within R Studio itself. So let me just switch over to R Studio now and continue from there. All right, so here we are within our studio, and this is what it should approximately look like when you first start it. So in particular, you see that there are these four main areas on the screen. This area here on the top left, then this one in the bottom left, then you have the top right and the bottom right. And I'm going to explain what these mean uh, in a moment. Just one thing you should be aware of is that it is possible that when you first start this, you do not see this top left area. That would happen if this leaf here would be closed like this. And in that case, you only see that area taking up your whole left hand side. If that would be the case, it's an easy fix. You just need to click on that button up there and then click on our script. And if you do that, then lo and behold, we're back to where we started from. Okay, so let's take now a look at each of these four panels in turn. And let's start with this bottom panel down here. So this is where we can directly communicate with R. It is called the R console, as you can see, it's written right there. And we can type in R instructions here, which then immediately get processed by R and we get back the result. So uh, we don't know how to program R yet, but for example, an expression such as two plus two, you can guess what that does. And in order to execute it, to give it to R to, for processing and for it to return a result, you have to press the enter key, or if you are using a Macintosh, then the return key. So I press enter and I get back the perhaps not too unexpected result of four. Notice also that the result, number four, is preceded by this strange looking bracketed number one. Do not worry just yet about what that means. We'll cover that later in the course. For now, just accept that whatever computation you might have, for example, let's enter another one like three times six. The result is 18 as it should be. It's prepended by that bracketed number one. And that will always be the case no matter what expression you run. So as for now, please do not worry about that. 
Okay, so next up is this area up over here. Now, superficially, this is similar to the bottom area in the sense that we write expressions in R over here. So we could write our 2 plus 2 over here, just as down below. Except if I press Enter or Return on a Mac, nothing happens, just a new line opens and I can keep on typing, for example, our earlier expression 3 times 6 and so on and so forth. Uh, so this really here, this area up here, is just a simple text editor to write in R instructions. And R will not touch these until we explicitly tell the system, that is R Studio, to send our expressions down to R, and then it will work with them. So how do we do that? Well, one way to do that is to highlight the line or lines that we want to run and then click the run button that you can see over here and if you do that watch what will happen down there i click the button and you see that the uh, instruction has been sent down two plus two and then r immediately processed it and returned the result four same happens if we highlight that line and click run we get back the result 18 down there and you can even highlight multiple lines at the same time like this and then click on run. And if you do that, then R will execute each of these lines one by one. So let's click there and you see both of these have been sent down and both of them has, have been processed. Incidentally, this is a good segue into one thing that can be quite annoying. So what would happen if you would try to highlight these two lines, but accidentally only highlighted this much and forgot the six. Well, before doing anything, notice that down here, whenever R indicated that it is ready for us to do some input and computation, it prepended the line with this greater than symbol. That's a so-called prompt. And what that means is, dear user, I am ready for your input. Now, if we accidentally only highlight this much and then click on run, then a strange thing happens. First of all, the first line that we highlighted, 2 plus 2, gets executed, no problem. But since only part of the second line was highlighted, we get three times, and then the expression is incomplete, and R indicates that it is waiting for further input by changing the shape of the prompt from this greater than symbol to this plus symbol. So what the plus symbol means down here is that the expression above is incomplete, you should finish it in some way. And there are multiple ways of finishing it. So first of all, if you click down there with the mouse, there we go. Then you put the control, the, the focus of the cursor down there. So you can type in the missing number six. And if you do that, then this whole thing three times six will be treated as one single unit. So if you press enter, then you get back the result 18. If you don't do that, so if you simply type in three times and you press enter, and then you just press enter again, then uh, you still get back the prompt that you need to finish whatever you're doing here. If you just want to exit this because you've just done a mistake, you want to start the whole expression over again, then what you have to do is, first of all, be sure to have the focus of your cursor up there. So that means that if you happen to be up here, say, the focus is there, then make sure to, ex uh, to, to actively go down here press the mouse button and put the focus of your cursor down there and press the escape key. And if you do that, then you escape the current computation and you're back into your safe area where you can start entering expressions from scratch. Next up, let us talk about this top right panel, which is called the environment. Now the environment holds all those objects that you want your currently running R session to remember. That means that as long as R Studio and R are running and you don't just close the program by clicking on the close button, this uh, will be remembered by R. Let me give you an example. Again, we will cover this in detail later, but one can actually define symbols to stand for numbers. So for example, I could say that I want X to be equal to three times six. And the, this symbol here is just made up of the less than and the dash. And if you think about it, they form sort of a funny arrow symbol here. So what we're doing is we're assigning the result of three times six 
to the symbol X. And if we press enter now, then seemingly nothing happens, but actually now R remembers the value of X. And if you look here up in the environment, you see that indeed that is the case. Now there is a variable here called X whose value is actually 18. So this also means that we can continue doing computations with this value. For example, we could compute the value of two plus X. And if you do that, then you get back the result 20 because X is actually equal to 18. So whenever R sees that symbol X, it substitutes in its value that you can see here. And then we add two to that and we get the result 20 as expected. All right, so finally there is this bottom right panel. And if you notice, it consists of several sub panels like files, plots, packages, help, and so on. Each of these will be helpful to us eventually, but for now, let's just focus on files over here. So you can navigate around in your directory tree using this panel. In particular, I have a folder called home, within home I have a folder called classes, within which I have a folder called 2024. I am currently this term teaching three classes. That is the one that you are listening to right now, nbib53. So if I click on it, then I move into the contents of that folder, which you can then see. If you want to move up the directory tree, you can just click those two dots up there, and then you move back upwards. With that, it is time to look at the somewhat confusing yet very important concept of a working directory. So let's see what I mean by that with an example. So I will go into this folder here and I will go to class number one. That folder has a particular file, this one here, islandfl.csv. Don't worry about what that is. It's a particular data file. So I want to actually read the contents of this file. And let me show you how you can do that. And do not worry about the details at this point. First of all, I will load the tidyverse suite of packages. Do not again worry about what this is right now. Uh, you will have plenty of time to worry about that later on. Uh, and then I'm just going to say read CSV. And then island uh, dash fl dot csv. So in other words, I type out the name of that file. However, if I try to run this, it will fail. And the, re the reason is the following. You first of all, read the error message. Error messages are important to read in general. You should you should not be afraid of error messages. Instead, use them to guide you. And you can always Google an error message if you don't know what it means. Uh, the internet has very, very good resources for uh, explaining what these things uh, actually refer to. So the problem here, it says error islandfl.csv does not exist in current working directory. And then it also tells me what my current working directory is. It is in fact my home folder. The problem is that this file here is not in my working directory. So in order to put it there, I have to nominate this folder to be the working directory. In other words, the folder which then serves as the origin for any sort of file that we want to access or load. How do we do that? Uh, there are multiple ways to do that, but I think the most convenient is to click on this cogwheel over here and then choose the option set as working directory. You click on set as working directory and then notice that all this does is it sends this R instruction for processing. So what this command does is it changes where your working directory is. In particular, now it is in classes 2024 MBIB 53 slash class 01. If now we try to run this line, read CSV, islandfl.csv, ta-da, it actually reads in the file successfully. Do not worry about what this output means. Do not worry about what it does. Just uh, observe the fact that this now worked instead of throwing back an error. And the reason it worked is because when we want to load a file like this, then it has to be in the proper working directory that we are working with. 
So by that I mean that if the file is in this particular folder, then we have to set the working directory to be that folder. You do not necessarily need to do that if you are willing to type out a full path. So I could say home directory and this, this little wiggly symbol, the tilde stands for home directory, and then slash classes, oops, uh, I can't spell, this was a capital C, slash classes, slash 2024, slash NBIB53. This is all that information that we were uh, working through before. You can see that over here as well. And then another slash and then class, uh, zero 01 and then slash islandfl.csv. This will also work. And now it would not matter where your working directory is set because you've explicitly specified the path right from the home directory to the end. So you can do this, but this is painful. You do not want to enter long paths, not to mention that if you write R programs that you will then give to other people to use, they will not have the same file or directory structure that you do. For example, none of you who view this video have this exact same directory structure uh, on your computer. So this will literally not work on your computer. So that is why it is a better option to find the file you want to work with, set it, set its folder to be the working directory. Again, how do we do that? We click on this cogwheel and we choose set as working directory. By the way, you can see your current working directory over here as well. So you can always take a sneak peek there and, and see where it is set. And once you have set the working directory correctly, you do not need any of this nonsense. Let's just erase that long path that's just in the way. And this will still work just as intended. So once again, this is important to do whenever you start your R session, just set the working directory correctly to be able to find files. Otherwise, you will see that you get an error that files are not found. So this is actually important to do and to be aware of. So again, the concept of a working directory, be sure that you understand what it does and how it works. All right, so that concludes a quick rundown of what each of these four panel areas are actually for. Before going on, let me show you some of the customization options that you have at your disposal. So if you go up into the menu bar and choose tools, click on that, and then go down here to global options, then you will have a new window open where you can set various global options. For example, if you're not happy with where your default working directory is, you can change it here. Again, this wiggly line, do not be afraid of that. That simply means your home folder, if that's what you see. But you can easily change it. You just click on browse and you can mess around and find the proper folder in your own directory tree that you want to use. So that is an example here that you can do. Otherwise, there are various options for editing code. For example, I highly recommend that you have that option ticked in, insert spaces for tabs. What that means that if you press the tabulator key, I will actually demonstrate that for you for a moment. So I'll press cancel here to go back for a moment into this area. So if I press the tabulator key, then you see that my cursor is jumping forward two steps at a time. But when I instruct insert spaces for tabs, instead of treating that as a tabulator character, it will internally treat those as spaces and that's actually very good to have. So, so it's a, a very good idea to have that turned on. So I'm going to go back to the menu. So tools and then global options. And then I went to the code leaf over here. Uh, so it's good to have that option in. And yes, a tab width of two, which means that one press of the tabulator in, will insert two spaces. That's quite standard here. So feel free to use that. This is a line that you should have ticked in, but you might not see it in your version. If you do not see it, that means that your R version is earlier than 4.1. If so, then my recommendation would be to upgrade your R version to a more recent one. Uh, otherwise, as the course goes on, you'll get by. I will tell you how to work around this. But again, the most convenient option is just to have a sufficiently up to date version and then be sure to have this option ticked in. We will be making use of that. 
Then there are other options that you can explore here, like you have console options. I'm not going to mess with those here. Appearance, that you should feel free to customize. So first of all, notice that my zoom level is at 150%, but that is just so that the uh, picture shows up well in a video. Usually I would turn this down to 100%. You can choose your editor font, uh, the editor font size and the help panel font size, and you can choose an editor theme. So the default theme, is what I have been showing you here and that's what it should open with first but there are many 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 different themes that you can uh, look through here so you know just showing you some it shows sort of a, a preview of what it would look like uh, I personally really happen to like this theme here tomorrow night 80s so I'm actually going to keep it that way so I'm going to scroll down here and click on apply and notice that in the background now my R studio has turned black. Next up in terms of options, there is this button here, which is pane layout, which tells you where those four areas will be on your screen that we've talked about. So when it, where it's a source, that's where you enter in our source code. That's why it's called source. Then you have the environment in the uh, top right. Then you have the console area. That is the area where you enter our instructions directly on the bottom left. And then the files, plots, packages, etc., on the bottom right. I actually really like it if the console area is up here and the environment is down there. So I am going to change this around now. I'm going to put the console area up here and then notice that automatically the environment uh, is placed down there. This I think is much more convenient. So again, I'll go down here and then I'll just click on OK or well, apply or OK, but I'm not going to show any more uh, options here. So we can just press OK and then we quit. And notice that now the screen got rearranged a bit. We have uh, this region and that region unchanged, but those two regions got flipped around. So I think this is better because modern screens are more wide than they are uh, tall and therefore we can drag down these areas which we're not going to be maybe looking at so much and have sufficient space to look at these two things that we are going to be looking at quite a bit. So this is something that can improve your quality of life. You're more than welcome to use it. You don't have to use it. Again, the theming is another thing that you can choose the one that suits you best. You don't have to choose the same one that I like to use. It is really just up to you, whatever makes your own life and work the most comfortable. Next up, I wanted to talk a little bit about packages. So as I mentioned, packages are programs that were written by other users so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can just use their implementations of whatever they use. So you can click the packages leaf here in this bottom area. And actually, let me now increase this here. And you see uh, all sorts of packages here that are installed on my particular computer. If you want to install new packages, you can click here on the install panel and write in whatever you want to install. For example, if I want to install the tidyverse, then here it is. And then you can tick this in, which means, uh, says install dependencies, which means that any packages which this package or packages depend on will also be installed. And then you can click on install. I am not going to do this now because I have it installed already. But if you don't, then you should definitely do this on your computer. There's actually another way to do that because this panel here is really just a shorthand way of entering the following. Let's go here into the R console. And if you type in install dot packages, and then in parentheses and in quotes, put in the package name like this. And then you press enter on a PC and return on a Mac as usual. Then this will run and this will install the tidyverse package for you. I'm not going to do that again because I already have it installed. You should do it though. Fair warning, however, this can take quite a while to install. So depending on what other things might already be on your computer, this can take anything 
from five minutes to a bit more than an hour. So just run this at a time when you potentially have some time for it to actually do its thing. It will just churn away and that's perfectly normal. Do not freak out. It can take a while, but please be sure that you have this installed because later on in this course, we are going to be heavily relying on this package or rather this system of packages because it's actually uh, a name for multiple packages that get installed under the name of Tidyverse. Finally, one topic that I wanted to touch on is getting help in R. So let me just get rid of that for now. If you need to get help about something, then you can easily get that within the R system itself. So let's let's take an example. For example, you don't know this yet, but I'm going to tell you to compute the square root of some uh, number, for example, the square root of the number nine, you write that this way in R. You write out SQRT, all lowercase letters, no spaces within them, then a pair of parentheses, and then within the parentheses, the number nine. And then you press enter, and you get back the result three. If you want help on something like this, then you can just type out a question mark and write out SQRT. And if you press enter, then notice that down here, in the bottom right area, the leaf switched from wherever you were, like packages, to help. And here you have a description of the function square root, along with possibly other functions that are related. Here you also have the absolute value function described. And first you have a little bit of a description of what the function does and what information there is about it. Then you get some information about what kind of input goes into these functions. That's under the heading arguments. Then you have some more details about how these functions actually work, what are some of their quirks and so on, some references. You also have some tips for what else to look at if you want to explore more along the same lines as the function you asked help for. And finally, this is very useful. You have some example code that shows you how to use the functions that you have in real life examples. So I know that this can look a bit intimidating if this is the first time you see this, but don't worry about this. As we will keep using R, actually very soon this will start making a lot of sense. So just keep this in mind that if you type out a question mark and then the name of a function and then press enter, then you can get help on any function in this way. Incidentally, if you uh, don't want to type it out this way, then, well, let's just assume that we were in some other panel like the files. You can just click on the help panel like this and then type in the name of the function here. So let's take another function, say the cosine function, cos, which is a built-in function. And then you get actually not just the cosine function, but a whole bunch of trigonometric functions. And you get their description here, what their arguments are and details on them and example code at the end that can be very helpful for you to run to see how it works. Again, right now, I know this will not make the most sense for you, but as time goes on and then in fact, very, very soon, it will make a lot of sense. What additional resources are there, by the way, for getting help with R? Actually, there is a lot of material online, as I already mentioned, in terms of error messages. So whenever you see an error message that is a bit cryptic, or you try to read it and it doesn't make sense, which will happen initially at least. And then as you get more experience, you'll understand them better. But initially you'll get confused by error messages. That is normal. But then don't freak out. Just copy the error message, paste it into Google and see if anybody has had similar issues to work with then you can use Google in other ways as well. So for example, if you want to create some sort of graph, then if you simply Google, how do I create a scatter plot using ggplot, for example, that Google message will bring up useful information for you that you can use. And don't worry about it. If you didn't quite understand what I just said, you will get there quite soon in this course. There is one particular website that I should mention, which is Stack Exchange, which has a section on R. It usually, so Stack Exchange is really a forum for people who program. 
So it has different sections based on which programming language people work with. There is one for R and it is a very friendly community. And in fact, I, it's so friendly and so helpful that I would go so far as to say that that is one of the main advantages to using the R programming language, that the community is especially helpful, friendly, uh, and will try to sort problems out. The thing is, you can ask questions on Stack Exchange if you sign up, but most of the time you won't even need to do that because somebody else has already asked a very similar question. You can just look at what the answers were and based on those answers, fix your own problem. All right, so that's it for a somewhat long and heavy introduction to RStudio and the basics of R. This was just to give you an overview on how to use RStudio and how to make it comfortable for you and what kind of options there are. We'll continue from here and the next time we will actually take, be taking a look at the basics of R. So we'll be building up our R programming knowledge from the ground up. So that's it for today and I will see you next time.